Today's lecture now will be about how are neural networks being used these days and what's the sort of coolest stuff going on with neural networks. Um, in particular over the summer neural networks were um, all over the media. They were in the front page of the New York Times and, um, and that has to do with the fact that I think we've reached a point at which it's possible to implement very large scale neural networks and get them to do some useful things. And um, I will go over these examples and essentially I will describe what, what was this neural network that made it all over the media as well as describing a recent neural network that has been winning many of the competitions um, in the Kaggle websites, bioinformatics competitions. Um, but in the same network is learning, uh, is being applied to learn to recognize objects and it has been very successful in the Pascal competitions. Okay, so today we will go over those networks. We will learn about a particular type of neural network that is used for unsupervised learning called the Noto encoder. Um, we will look at how to use neural networks to do object recognition, how to do face detection, you know, like in your cameras that detect your faces very easily. And we will learn about a lot of um, sophisticated regularizers that you can bring in into re neural networks to actually achieve um, uh, d different goals like for example invariant object recognition. Okay, so um, in the last class we looked at these very simple neural networks where we're given a data set consisting of an input xi and an output yi and here is sort of a plot here for this 1D function. And given these red points, we're able to fit the neural network, the green curve, um, to the red points. And two neurons, in this case, the, the, the neural network is just a linear combination of two neurons. Um, two neurons is enough to represent this function because each neuron is just a step function. And we have parameters that allows us to transform that neuron. So we can squash it horizontally and vertically. We can shift it up and down, left, right, and we can flip it over by negating the thetas. So because we have all the control, we can, just using this very simple brick, we can construct a nonlinear function, and we can approximate well that function, um, uh, the red dots. Uh, if we have, if we add more neurons, we will get an even more complex um, regression function. And there's a natural question of asking ourselves, how many neurons should we add? And I mentioned that one of the ways to answer that question is to do cross-validation. And this is this, and once we define a neural network, um, in the case of regression, we can think of the output of ne the neural network as the mean of the Gaussian distribution. So if we think of each red point as the data point, the noise is in the y's, y hat is the prediction, y is the true data that was given to us. And so the difference between y and y hat is just the cost function. That's what we need to minimize. But the sum of squared errors, um, if you negate it and exponentiate it, essentially gives us a Gaussian. So there is this natural mapping between probability distributions that predict the y's and, and cost functions. And then we went through this exercise in the class where we showed how one can use the chain rule to compute derivatives of that quadratic error with respect to any parameter, like for example in this case with respect to theta 2. And once we have those derivatives, it's very easy to just apply an online gradient descent um, to learn the theta. So that, that's essentially what your homework is about. Um, I mentioned you could use also different types of basis functions. Um, Folks are trying different basis functions out there. Um, one of the things that I didn't mention was uh, regularization. Um, so just like we did for linear regression, um, our cost function um, for all the parameters will be a sum from over all the data cases of the true label minus the prediction. Okay? 
and the prediction is a function of the input and it's a function of the parameter. Now, if that's our cost function, we've learned that in the linear case, we can get better predictions if we add a regularizer. So I could very easily add a regularizer to this cost function. So I could add plus lambda some regularizer of theta. And then the question is, which regularizer do we add to? So examples of R of theta could be DL2 norm squared. So that would give rise to the ridge. And the ridge in neural networks has a name, uh, weight decay. <coughs> now the ridge is really easy to implement because the derivative of theta squared is just two times theta. Uh, two times the vector theta. So it, it's very easy to uh, implement um, the ridge. So you just add theta to each update of the gradient. Um, it's differentiable. We also use the L1 norm of the vector theta. And the L1 norm is just the sum from J equal 1 to, in this case we have seven parameters, so it would be to seven of theta i or theta j. So it's a sum of absolute values. Now why would that be a useful regularizer? Um, it would be useful because it forces the thetas to go precisely to zero. So the effect of that is that if we have several inputs, in this case we only have one input in this neural network so it's not that interesting, but if we had several inputs we could arrange for some of those inputs to disappear and so that, that thereby effectively we would decide which inputs are relevant. We can do something even smarter. We can introduce regularizers that only look at a subset of neurons. So in particular we could use a regularizer that I'm going to call it a 2-1 regularizer which will be a sum from K um, equal 1. Okay, let, let me, instead of introducing heavy notation, let me try to write it very easily with simple notation. The regularizer will be theta 1 squared plus theta 2 squared plus theta 3 squared plus theta 4 squared. And I would add here actually theta 6 and plus theta 7. So what we're doing is, we're looking at, I've, I've put this into two groups. One group are the parameters that go with neuron 1, and one group is the parameters that go with neuron 2. And essentially what I'm trying to say is, let's do the sum of those, the weights of neuron 1 plus the weights of neuron 2. Now the sum of positive things is, in a way, it's the absolute, it's just the L1 norm, because the L1 norm is just summing positive uh, things. And when I take the norm, theta 1 squared plus theta 2 squared, um, actually there's different ways to implement this. So I'm going to take theta 6, whoops. Ah, yeah, <laughs> doing some crazy stuff. What I'm trying to say is we, this regularizer that I have here is essentially a sum over the neurons for each neuron in the hidden layer 
I look, I sum the norm of the weights. Okay. So it's the sum of the L2, the L2 norm of the weights corresponding to a neuron. So it's an L1 of an L2. Because the sum of something positive is just the L1 norm. So essentially I'm grouping terms. I'm grouping all the parameters that go with one neuron and I compute the L2 norm of that. I look at the next neuron and I, I group it as I've done there in the second group. And then that's going to, my penalty now, it's going to be uh, lambda times this plus lambda times this other group. That way I will try to force a whole neuron to be switched off. Instead of just switching a single link, I'm trying to switch off a neuron. I'm trying to remove a whole neuron in one go. So this is called the uh, L1, L2 norm. And in, in general, the L1, L2 norm is just the sum from i equal 1 to k, let's say j equal 1 to k, and then of the L2 norms of the vector j. So in group j, there's still a group of vectors, theta j, and I'm computing its L2 norm. This will, this sort of sum of square terms um, is going to come up soon when we explain the Google network. Okay. Now, all of this, you've all seen this picture of uh, the person that's kept me awake for the last month. Um, and here comes now a big question. We've learned to do supervised learning with neural networks. But how do we do unsupervised learning with neural networks? You had a question. Uh, going back a little, a little. So regularizers were introduced as a way to smooth out the optimization function with respect to the features we have. That's correct. So is there a way to smooth out the optimization function with respect to the class classes present in our training data? I think I will answer your question a few slides. Just give me, let me get there. I'll, I'll ask you again when I get there. But let me move on. Moving on to the unsupervised case. We've seen ways of doing unsupervised learning in this course. Which ones? PCA uh, with the SVD and so on. Um, and even using the base nets when we were learning the parameters of a base net, in a sense there was no supervision. We just had um, a lot of data and we were trying to infer the structure of the base net or infer its parameters. The prostate is not cancer. Oh, but it was annotated with a label. You were trying to predict the label which was an antigen. So the prostate cancer example was a regression. There was labels Y and there was inputs X. And we were, and you did the lasso to predict the Y. But PCA was just sort of the example that we looked at. Now, most of learning in the world happens in an unsupervised way. Like when I, this is my baby, she's staring at her mom. Um, trust me, I'm not teaching her how to recognize a face. <laughs> but I know she's capable of doing that. She, in fact, was able to do that from the moment that she was born. Now, this is what we saw in the course early on. We learned to do PCA. And the idea of PCA, the cost function for PCA, was essentially given a matrix of images, X, find two matrix B and C that approximate X. Okay, just find a reconstruction of X um, using two matrix B and C. And for PCA, we discovered that those matrix where B would be equal to U sigma, and C would be equal to V transpose. In other words, the SVD is the optimal L2 reconstruction. I then mentioned 
that if you in addition add to it an extra term which penalizes the magnitude of the v vectors that we would then get something called sparse coding which looks like this so this is PCA this is sparse coding And so each of these guys is one of the filters that gets active when you look at an image patch. Essentially that's the interpretation because we take a lot of image patches and we, compute, uh, we convert the image patches to vectors, we compute the SVD and then once we have the V matrix what we do is we go from a vector to an image and that's each of those plots is one of the Vs one of the eigenvectors. So the first image there that I've highlighted in a box in blue is V1 and then the next image is V2 and so on. If you apply regularization you get something that looks completely different. Now each eigenvector starts looking like an edge detector because it's an image that on one side is, there's light, white and on the other side there's darkness. So it's looking for things in the image where there's strong contrast. Now we argued that we want machine learning systems that look like this. And the reason goes back to a ve this very old experiment of Hubel and Wiesel who showed a cat uh, a bar and, and then we saw actually a video of that. And there's lots of videos in YouTube of the Hubel and Wiesel experiment which I recommend. Um, and you move um, unless you're sensitive to, there's some very cruel animal experiments in it. You move a bar left and right and when the bar is at the particular angle as, uh, as there in um, case D, a specific neuron that you're measuring starts firing like crazy. Well, it's, it's, it's neurons fire spikes. So the, what that means is that neurons in V1, which is the first stage of sensory vision in your cortex are, are selective to or orientations. They detect edges and each neuron detects a different edge and there's a whole entire topographic organization that allows you to essentially detect all the edges in an image. So being able to construct a machine learning technique that allows us to detect edges is actually quite useful. Here is the solution for training neural networks in an unsupervised way. Um, I took these slides from Andrew Ng. Um, we were all teaching recently at, in, at UCLA uh, um, at, uh, in the summer school. Um, the basic idea in order to train a neural network in an unsupervised way is something that's called an autoencoder. It's a very old idea. I don't know the original reference, but I know there were papers on this already way back in the 90s or 70s. And so the idea is, as an input, you take the, the image and then you make the neural network predict the same image as the output. So what I see is my training data. In other words, it's, this goes back to this thing we discussed at the beginning of the course. If you can close your eyes and you can predict what you're seeing, you're, you're able to understand the world. And so you take the image, so you take the, <coughs> all the images that you observe and you try to predict them. What you do to make for this to make sense because if you let your brain be big enough your brain could have all the images in the world. You could uh, save them. Now the space of images that we encounter in the world is, is huge but is tiny in comparison to the total space of images. If you have images that are of size a thousand by a thousand, small images, so recall that we say that there are uh, about one million fibers in the optic nerve that goes back to V1 from your um, eye. So that would be dealing with uh, neurons that are about size thousand by a thousand. Now if your neurons, if you look at the space of images that are thousand by a thousand that are black and white say for example, 
um, that space is 2 to the million. If you want them to have 256 values, it's 256 to the million. Okay? That's a huge space. That's way more images than any of you will ever see in your life. How do you the, avoid a neuron to a pixel? Or, you know, what's the comparison you're doing in terms of the number of Oh, I'm just making a simple, very rough estimate that one photoreceptor is one pixel. But even if you don't make that, let's just make a very simple argument that's just based on machines. Sure. 256 pixels, grayscale image. There are, if you have a million by a million, the possible images that you could have of size of 1,000 by 1,000 is 256 to the power of 1 million. Okay. Now that's a huge space. That's more images than we ever see. Um, and that's because the images in the world are regular. The brain is a reflection of nature. If we had evolved on a different planet, we'd have different brains. Uh, it's a product of evolution. We have a world where the space of images is very constrained. They tend, images tend to be <coughs> smooth. There's edges all over. And that's what we're going to exploit um, to, uh, to learn. Now, but that space is still very large. So what you actually want then, when you do reconstruction with the neural network, is you want to introduce a bottleneck. So you create a hidden layer, and you want that hidden layer to have less neurons than the size of the image. So you're able to compress the image, and from that compression, you're able to expand again, and you still get the image. In other words, you're able to do the reconstruction. If you do that, then if we can compress and decompress, or in other words, encode and decode, and reconstruct the image, then we've, in effect, we've learned what that image is. We've learned what are the important things in that image. Um, another thing that one does if, uh, um, after training this is that after training, you then forget, you can forget about these weights here that allow you to get the reconstruction, and you just look at this. Um, the first part of the neural network, and that essentially now is an encoder. Given an image, which is a very large object, it projects the image to a low dimensional space. So think of it as PCA, but it's now nonlinear PCA. It allows you to get a, a low dimensional representation of the image. You could compress it to 2D, so you could take big vectors of images, compress them to 2D, and then you could do the 2D layouts that you did for your homework with PCA. Except now with a neural network, you would be able to get much better layouts. There's another advantage of um, having an architecture like this, and it's the following. I can take billions of images of South Africa, and I can train a neural network like this. And then when I move to Canada, that neural network is still useful. If I learn all the types of images that exist in Africa, when I move to Canada and I'm introduced to a new thing in Canada that I need to learn to recognize, like, um, I don't know, a raccoon, because we don't get those in South Africa, then I would just take the outputs, the three outputs of the neural net activations, and then all I have to learn is three parameters. So I just learn logist I just do logistic regression. But the idea is I've pre-learned all the features. <coughs> when I lived in South Africa, I learned what fangs were, I learned what teeth <laughs> were, I learned what fur was. So when I come to Canada and I go and hike in the forest and I see a furry cr creature with big teeth. I don't need, you know, it's very clear. I immediately detect all those features, and I know I'm in danger. So this is called transfer learning, or self-taught learning. Um, Andrew calls it self-taught learning. The other groups call it uh, transfer learning. Um, and in Pearl talked about this when he visited us. He, he called it transport learning. The idea of you learn a theory somewhere, and then you're able to transport it to a different world. 
And this is essential. We learn features in an unsupervised way. We learn detectors, we learn sort of high level features. And then we, we move to another place in order to be able to quickly recognize, say, um, a bear, you use all the things that you've learned about fur and so on before. There was a hand up. Um, that sort of bottleneck layer that you're showing up there, do you think that's happening in the retina? And no, the ret well, actually, there is a bottleneck in the retina, and then it gets expanded again. Yeah. Um, so and the, there's an overcomplete representation. Okay. So are, um, are you, like, I guess, is if, if we try to map this in a very rough way to what's actually happening when you, you know, light comes into the eye and then it gets projected onto the one or something like that? You could try to get the numbers right. I, I don't know if experiments have tried to actually get exact numbers, right, or if we were there, but um, I haven't done a count myself. At the end of the class, we can go over some papers and I can sort of compare. I don't know, I don't know if we are at the stage where we're using 20 million neurons in the first hit and later it's on. I don't know how big the scale is. I think we're still very far from it. We still need more parameters. OK. Um, what people often do, so th there's two ways in which we could train a neural network like this to reconstruct. So essentially what, what we do, if we had a neural network with linear units, not with sigmoidal units, what we would do is we would go from the input to the output. So this would be the output. And then we go from the output to the input. So in other words, we have the input, we have the hidden layer, and then we go back to the input. So that was the sort of the network that we had. And then we have the weights W and then W transpose here. Um, so this is our, our reconstruction x hat. So we're minimizing the difference between our reconstruction and x, and then we add to it a regularizer. Now the regularizer is very important, and uh, one of the things you can do is you can use, there's this log cos function that actually is a, a smooth way of approximating an L1 regularizer. Um, you, and you could also use something that's like the group L1 regularizer that we just discussed. And I will get to an example very soon. Um, an alternative way of doing um, this network is instead of using linear neurons, you could use a sigmoid neuron. So you feed um, the input through a set of sigmoids to encode, and then you decode. So we have two stages, encoding and decoding. <coughs> it turns out then in order to get filter detectors like those over there um, that I'm showing you, and, and to understand these images in the neural network context, each of these images here, each of these guys, is the weights that go from each of the inputs to a single neuron. Okay. So, this is the image, the input image, and if I, and the weights that go from the input image to a single neuron, there are as many weights as pixels in the image. They're all values between, they're all real values. So I can actually visualize the weights as an image, right? Because this would be pixel one all the way up to pixel six, so that's an image. So I could also then take this will be my pixel one, and then this weight here will be my pixel two, and so on. And when I do that, I essentially get this guy here. So that would be neuron one. And then this other guy, the green guy, might be neuron two, which might be, say, this guy here. So I basically look at all the weights that go into this neuron, and that gives me another image. And so, in order to get these 
sparse basis, I need to simply add that an L1 regular, some form of L1 regularize. It turns out that if you don't add a regularizer, then you would just get PCA basis. You would go with a linear network, you would go back to basically having sinusoids. And that's the, the sort of global basis don't match what we observe in V1. So in order to have edge detectors, the key is to add the regularize. And in fact, we don't even need the nonlinear functions. We can, we can just use linear neurons and use a, a good regularize. So does the, is, in PCA, we could just take the, um, this, the Vs that correspond to the small uh, like singular values. Mm -hmm. So to the large here, singular values. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, here, is it straightforward what, like maybe some neurons, they're similar to each other and they, we don't need them? Or does the L1 regularizer take care of that and knock those? I mean, this effectively will sort of do very similar thing to, to what, you do, what we did with PCA, but with the L1 norm. So if you do PCA with an L1 norm, it gives us these uh, bases over here. What we're doing here is very similar, but instead of using the SVD, we, we actually use gradient descent. We just do gradient descent to minimize, in other words, we compute the derivative with respect to W equate to zero. Oh, don't equate to zero, compute the derivative and then just follow the derivative. Yeah. And, and main, the main reason for doing that is that the data matrix is so large that doing the SVD actually becomes prohibitively expensive. The cost of the SVD is n cube. And when you have billions of images or so, it's not practical at all to try the SVD. So this is essentially an online way of learning that representation. So what if we didn't keep some of the neurons, wouldn't there just be a hole in the image corresponding to that spot? Isn't that the whole point? There's a sparse thing that it gives sort of features of that image, like a, an edge, but if you, if you don't have that, if you don't have a high or low singular value, then you don't have all these ripples and you don't notice it by eye. But here, if you don't have a neuron, there'd be a hole in the image? There'll, be lots, of, there'll be lots of these neurons and many of them will be similar. So even if some are... Okay. No, I mean, if I want to represent, suppose I wanted to represent a, a two, in order to represent a two, I, I, I don't need all possible 20 million orientations and locations of a lie. You know, with a few hundred neurons, I can represent a two. You pretty much will cover all the possible lines that I would need to reconstruct a two. And there would be a lot of redundancy. So there's 20 million little lines. So not having all of them activate is fine. We'll still be able to get a good reconstruction. Okay, everything we've discussed so far is for a single layer. How do we deal with more layers? Um, this is how you go about it. Um, we do this, um, what we call the greedy layer-wise training. And this was sort of what gave rise to this whole field of deep learning that's become very popular lately. And it started with the works of Jeff Hinton and um, Jan LeCun and Joshua Benjamin. Um, the idea is we, we're going to use, we're going to start with the image as the input and we try to predict the image. And what that allows us to do is to learn what the hidden layer neurons which people often call the features. And they're called the features essentially because um, if we go back to the self-taught learning case, the, um, you can think of these as the features that we're going to use for classification. It's very hard looking at images to say from an image what are the important things in order to recognize whether a, an image <coughs> is a face or not a face. And in fact, for over three decades, people tried to do it by hand. And that, that's essentially the field of computer vision. And it's a field that failed. And it's only through learning techniques, like the ones that I'm 
talking about now and next week, that that problem of face detection was solved. And now all of you in your cell phones have face detection, I think. And that's essentially an application of the, these ideas. Not easy to do. Humans do not have the capacity to introspect and be able to actually come up with the rules. Uh, we saw some illusions in the first lecture that were, where it was obvious that you actually did not know how you saw. And in fact, you were surprised by all these change blindness illusions. Okay, so getting back to this, we have the first layer of features. And then what we do essentially is we take these features and we do a further encoding to get a second layer of features. So that first layer of features is trying to predict itself and so on. And so now if we take the, the first layer plus the second layer plus the third layer, we, we've now created a sort of a deep architecture. We start getting neurons uh, embedded within other neurons. So when you build then a classifier, if you want to do, so in the end you would just store this. These are your features. Given the features, you can just learn a classifier just like we did before. Uh, for transfer learning. And so that's the idea. You go from, you learn the first features, then the second features, uh, you learn the final classifier, and if you put it all together, you get a deep neural network. The reason why we train them like this is because if you just start by writing the full neural network and run back propagation on it, it's actually very expensive. Um, your error terms often have um, these expressions that are the output of a logistic times 1 minus the output of a logistic. So a lot of these error terms, as you're doing the chain rule and propagating, they tend to go to zero. So it's a phenomenon that's called as vanishing gradients. So the gradients give you very little signal. So the optimization is extremely slow. Instead, by doing this greedy layer-wise training, you can get algorithms that quickly get a good solution. And then right at the end, when you're done, you can still run back propagation on the full network and just fine tune the weights. And uh, folks often do that. Now, the Google network. The Google network that made the news, it, has, it had billions of parameters. I'll come to some of the details. Um, it essentially was following this idea. So each autoencoder uh, started with an image of size 200 pixels. Now images, color images are RGB channels. So you would have three channels, RGB or HSV or whatever encoding you use. Let's say that they're RGB, red, green, blue. Um, 200 pixels, and then the first thing that they do is that they only allow um, each group of eight neurons to be connected to a group of about 18 neurons. That's to decrease the size of the image. And that first stage of weights is what they call W. And then they will introduce a further compression, which I will explain soon, using weights H. And then they do an operation called local contrast normalization, which is essentially standardization. Now, the overall training objective for this neural network is, once again, this is just reconstruction error, encoding, decoding. They allowed W1 and W2 to be different, but they only did this so that they could run it on their 16,000 cores efficiently. Um, you could just have W1 be W2 transpose. And then the L1 regularizer they use is this, the sum of L2 norms. Um, this is essentially the L2 norm of the, of the inputs times x squared, so multiplied. Um, so basically the input goes through two operations of W when we do encoding and decoding and then we multiply times a matrix of weights H in order to get a further compression. So back to a question that was asked before, here essentially when I do this, I'm actually regularizing um, the outputs. 
So I'm basically asking for one of these guys to go to zero. So one of the neurons to, uh, I'm trying to get rid of one single neuron by doing this L1, L2 norm. This epsilon that add, that's a small number, I think 0 0.1, that's just for numerical condition. Now, I'm going to now describe these operations, pooling and local contrast normalization. This is, the first stage is just a standard neural network. Um, pooling has the objective of trying, images are huge. And so in order to be able to deal, um, you know, if you take an image that is just a thousand by a thousand and you assign one parameter to each pixel, you already have one million parameters. So you're very quickly getting to very uh, uh, tough computational problems. What pooling tries to do is it tries to pick an average of a group of neurons in order to compress the image. Okay, so we try to just average or pick the, the largest, uh, the level of firing of the largest unit in order to go from a wind of, um, a wind of several units to a single unit. Um, the form that uh, was used in Google, and in fact these, these operations, by the way, they, don't, they actually were invented in the 70s. There was a machine called a neocognitron neo by a researcher called Fukushima that implemented this. And since the 70s, folks like Yannikun and so on, they've been um, trying all these operations. So none of this was new work, scientific work for Google. However, what Google made possible was to implement this with billions of parameters and 16,000 cores, the sort of thing that only companies with lots of computers and money are capable of doing. And with good researchers. They had a very good team of researchers, um, <coughs> including Marco Aurelio Ranzato, who gave me um, his, um, his slides. So the idea of pulling is essentially at the next layer as of neurons, as you go from, as you go from here to here, um, you essentially take a window of pixels and you just average their squared values and take the square root of that. So it's again a sum of, it's this L1 norm of L2 values. Um, the next operation um, the Google guys apply in order to go from here to here is local contrast normalization, which is something that we've already learned to do, which is to subtract the mean of the data and divide by the standard deviation of the data. And that's essentially make sure that all the data is comparable. So in more detail, this is what pooling does. If neurons are very similar, if you just perturb an image slightly, you wouldn't like neurons at deeper. If I'm seeing a, f a hand and I move it slightly, at the higher level in the layers, I would still want my hand neuron to be firing. So I don't want little perturbations to affect it. And the idea of pooling is to get rid of these perturbations. Because if I move it, I want nearby neurons um, to still fire. So if I have a group of nearby neurons, and suppose this neuron is more similar to this guy, to the first neuron, so that, and it's anti-correlated, so it <coughs> fires. If I have another nearby neuron that fires, I still want my output to remain at one. Okay, so as long as it's my activation is in the same group, the output neuron will still be active. That's essentially what it does. So small distortions do not affect the output. Contrast normalization is to do with scale. So I mentioned this, that um, when we did linear regression, we made all the inputs have the same scale, and that's because we're applying the same <coughs> lambda value of regularized it to all the inputs. Um, if you have an input that is if you're trying to classify, predict the prices of cars, and one input is the number of doors, and one input is number of miles per gallon, then one input has a very, is a very, will tend to be a large number, whereas another input is either just two or four. So if you do regularization, you'll get rid of one variable much more easily than the other. And if you change the units to instead of going from gallons uh, or from kilometers to miles, 
then you would have to relearn the network. What contrast normalization does, it makes, um, by subtracting the mean and divided by a standard variable, the standard variance, it makes all the inputs be between zero, sort of be in the range with high probability between zero and one, so that they are comparable. And that's the idea. So if you were to, the same, the neuron would fire the same if you just scale the input by a constant. So in other words, if the image gets a bit brighter, if I increase, if I switch, if I'm looking at my hand and I switch on the light or switch it off, I will, my, my hand neuron will still be firing. I would still be able to recognize a hand. Okay. So I've been talking about neurons that recognize hands and so on. How do I know this? Because there are these experiments that show that, um, again, putting electrodes in animals, um, that specific neurons fire for specific objects in the world. Like there is a, there are a group of neurons that would actually fire for any image of Halle Berry. Or in fact, for the name Halle Berry. So the concept of is causing a particular neuron to fire. It shouldn't be surprising. Somehow we understand what things are in the world and that's encoded in our brain. There's no magic, it's just physics. So Google decided to do the following thing. They decided to learn in an unsupervised way using the network that we just described. Uh, a model that had an autoencoder that had one billion parameters and it used about 10 million images of size 200 by 200 which were just crops from YouTube. And he here are some of those images. The network consisted of uh, three layers um, and with three stages um, which is the sort of subsampling um, then basically have the contrast pooling and then contrast normalization. Um, and then they trained um, it to reconstruct and they use uh, sparse regularizers. And there's a paper in ICML 2012 that describes the details. So that's basically each unit consists of this sort of uh, filtering or compression, L2 pooling and local contrast normalization. Mm -hmm. And then you've got that's just one stage and then you have three of these stages. In other words, you have three layers. And the first question they had is how do we know that this network learned something useful? And so what they did was the following. They took several images. So the first they trained the network without any supervision. So the network learned for weeks on 16,000 cores. I don't know if it was weeks, but certainly days, I would assume. Um, once they have trained this network, then they took a particular neuron in the output layer and they checked when does this neuron tend to fire. So then they showed this uh, neuron a bunch of images of faces and they looked at the activation of the neuron so this is the, uh, act on the x-axis in this histogram is whether the neuron fires or not. The histogram is essentially a count of how many times it fires for, uh, for a particular activation. So the number of images for which it fires. So this is the activation and we look at how many images uh, tend to fire for that particular value. And here it's showing that many images of faces tend to have a higher firing rate than images of non-faces. So that neuron tends to fire more for images of faces than for images of non-faces. So that neuron has learned in a completely unsupervised way to recognize faces. Why did they choose faces? They hadn't trained it on faces. Good question. Faces are, this is what, and, uh, um, they also did cats. And in fact, in the New York Times, they used cats. Because YouTube is full of cats and cats. Faces is important. Uh, babies are born recognizing faces. Faces are the first thing you need to be able to detect. But they actually did try other classes. It would depend on the training data. YouTube has lots of faces and cats, so 
These are the images that tend to make that neuron fire. Note that some, not all of them are exactly faces. Is that A with shadows? 